one. All right, so let's discuss one of the things that we're going to sell and or we're going to run across them out in the field. And you need to understand how these universal life policies are actually built. Now, this is an area where many, many people I find are confused. Okay, so I really, really think this video may be helpful to a lot of new people and maybe even some people that have been around a while. Uh, we're going to discuss on this video exactly how these universal life policies work. You're either going to be selling these or you're going to be coming against these out in the field. And many, many people are confused as to how these things work. So let's get started. I drew on the board a diagram. Now, all life insurance is built on this model, right? So this is a really good video to review over and over again, and you'll get a general idea of how life insurance works. But specifically to, you, to universal life, let's pretend I got a policy. I'm 50 years old, right? That's my age. I want $100,000 coverage, and I want to enforce the age 100. These are fictitious numbers. We're just going to go use this as a basis of our argument here, right? So let's just say we're going to be paying $100 a month for this coverage, right? It's going to, we're going to pay it for the next 30 or 40 years, and it's going to be enforced till age 100, okay? Now, because you're paying $100 a month for the coverage, you and I, and most people would assume that's the cost of the insurance. That's what it costs to insure me for 50 years old, $100,000 of the coverage, and to age 100. In other words, until I need it, I'm gonna, or, or until I pass away, the policy will always be there. Unlike term, where it kind of terms out, right? Term is it's called term for a reason. 15, 20, 30 years, it terms out, it's over, and you walk away, there's nothing there, right? Unless you're doing a return of premium product, and that's a completely different video. But in this case, this is going to be in, enforced till age 100. So let's just say again, you and I are going to pay $100 a month for it. We would assume that that's the cost of the insurance. It isn't. The cost of the insurance at these factors is actually $50. And most of you are going to say, well, why in the world am I paying $100 if the cost of the insurance is $50? Well, that's a good argument, and I'm glad you asked. That's the purpose of this video right so let's get into it okay so let's continue the reason why you're paying hundred dollars a month when the actual cost of the insurance is fifty dollars a month is because the excess money that you're paying every month the difference between these two figures right here 150 100 to 50 is going into what we call the IUL savings bucket right you're building up the savings account inside this this uh, this bucket here in your in your universal life policy right this line here actually represents the cost of the insurance. So we have right now at $100 a month, we're gonna draw a line straight through here, and let's just say the cost of the insurance is $50. The money's going into your savings account, right? And uh, now sooner or later, uh, it's going to cost $100 a month. Now there's nothing going into your savings. You're paying exactly what the cost of the insurance is. But someday, it's going to go to $110 a month, and that means you're not paying enough to keep this in force. If you're not paying enough to keep the policy in force, how is it staying in force without lapsing? Right? It's like making slightly below your mortgage payment every month. Sooner or later, chickens are going to come home and they're going to come get the house, right? How does that happen with, an IU, a, with a universal life policy? Well, here's the reason. At, at, every month that you're making, you're making $100 a month payment and the insurance is costing $110 a month, they are taking your money that you invest in this bucket plus interest to make this payment, this new payment, 110, and they keep doing that because as we get older, the, the cost of this insurance is no longer $50 a month. It goes to 100, 110, and keeps rising all the way up, right? Right, so now we're more than $100 a month. It's $110 a month, and it's, again, it's the interest that you're earning on your savings plus your premium payment to keep the policy in force to age 100, right? Okay, now, so understand, when someone talks about the target rate, what they're talking about is the interest off the $100 plus your premium payment will actually keep that policy in force uh, to age 100, right? I'm running out of ways to circle this, okay? To age 100, okay? It's $100 a month plus your premium payment, the interest off the $100 per month plus your interest payment uh, that's going to keep this policy in force because you're not paying now the cost of insurance. Now, a lot of times you'll put a plan together, and this is what I want you to really understand about these IULs or these ULs, Universal Life, is you're going to put a plan together uh, for someone that uh, costs $100 per month, right? 
Now here's where we need to pay attention, because this is where it gets confusing. And sometimes we end up losing business because of it. A lot of times, you'll put a plan together for someone, let's say it's again $100 per month, and some other agent's gonna come behind you and say, hey, Jack and Jill, I can do the same plan for you and get the same results, but it's only gonna cost you $70 per month. And guess what? They can, right? Now, but here's the problem. You're paying $70 a month. But look what just happened to your savings bucket, right? And here's what happens. This is why so many people's coverage blows up on them unexpectedly, uh, and they're out of insurance after paying on it for many, many years, right? You have now a savings bucket that's this large, Now, just because they put together a plan that he pays $70 a month, the cost of the insurance is still the same, right? So now he's paying $70 a month uh, for insurance that costs $100 a month and rising, but this is the only amount of savings he has in that, in that plan because he started out pay, making the target premium payment, which will never keep the policy funded long enough because this savings plus interest will not keep the policy in force up to 100 years. He's got a problem. Okay, before I move on, just to be clear, he's paying $70 a month, so this thing's going to go into lap status much sooner because as this premium begins to increase, he's at 70. The cost of insurance now is, let's just say, at 710, 725, 750, 800, and climbing, right? He's drawing from this savings bucket. It's a shallower bucket than it was before, and it also begins to go into lap status much sooner because again, the insurance is now costing over, you know, very quickly over $70 a month and he's only paying 70, right? And that's where you started getting that problem. The policy blows up, it's not funded properly and the people are left without any insurance and they wonder why. And that's why right there. You're, pay you're overfunding the policy early on to make up for the cost of insurance increases at the length of the policy to age 100 while your payments are staying level for the entire 30 or 40 years. Yeah. I hope you understand that, right? Your payments are not increasing, but the cost of insurance is increasing. And you're building up a savings account here to pull from to keep these premium payments paid, even though you're still making the minimum payment of $100 a month, right? Now, so to be clear, when you go past this $70 a month and the insurance starts costing 80, 85, 90, 100, and you're still paying 70, and the $70 a month plus interest on your savings account does not add up to what the current cost of insurance is because now we've gone beyond 70. What happens is, is the policy goes into what we call lap status and it cancels out and they're left uninsured. Now they're left uninsured usually, you know, 5, 10, 15 years down the road, maybe not quite that long. It usually blows up before that. And now they're looking for insurance again and they've lost their investment, right? All right, so when you go into someone's house, you can get your hands on their policy while you're in the home Here's what you need to do to find out what kind of policy they have and whether they're funding this policy properly or not is this. It should be in the first couple of pages of their policy. It should tell you at any given year how much cash they should have in their policy. Let's just say they're 12 years into the policy, right? I'm looking at my monitor over here making sure that uh, I'm still on the camera and the battery hasn't quit. So if you look at me, watch me glance away, that's why. I've got a monitor sitting over here and uh, uh, if the camera stops recording because the batteries die, that's the only way I can tell. So I'm not trying to look away from you on purpose, but I got to make sure I'm not talking to, the, to, uh, to nobody, right? So anyway, that's why I'm doing that. So uh, let's say you're 12 years into the policy, uh, and let's just say, for example, uh, they're supposed to have $12,000 built up in this policy, uh, and you look at their current statement, which they should also have from the insurance company, and let's just say it shows that $80,000, well, Houston, we got a problem right? Because they should have 12000 they only have 8000 they're $4,000 short that they need in order to keep this policy in force to age 100, right? Now, what the agent did uh, in this situation was in order to make the policy look good or their proposal to this, to this particular client, he minimum funded, they call it minimum funded, the, uh, the policy, meaning he quoted the minimum required payment to keep the insurance in place, right? Not the target premium, which will keep the policy in force to age 100. 
Okay, so the target premium keeps the policy in force age 100, but there's also a, uh, a minimum premium, which is a minimum funding the policy. So you can use this example in the home to kind of educate your clients on how these things work, but here's a trick. Okay, this is a, this is a pro tip here for you. Do not draw this out after you see their policy. Draw it out before you see their policy, because if you do it afterwards, they think you're trying to reinforce your position and your policy, and that somehow you're not being forthright with them. So if you do it before, and then they show you the policy, uh-oh, I was sort of afraid of, here's exactly what I was talking about, right? Afterwards, it doesn't have anywhere near the same effect. So let's move on. So when you're dealing with this in the home, one of the things I always do when I'm in this situation is I always ask them, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, Jack and Jill, whatever it is, uh, did a friend or family sell you this? And nine out of 10 will say yes. And I'm gonna say, well, I'm kind of in a tough spot here. Uh, and they usually interrupt me right then and there and, and, and tell me, look, I, I understand. Uh, we want to know the truth, just tell it like it is, and now you've got their permission because if it's a friend or family, you're walking on some hollow ground here. You want to be very, very careful that you don't offend them, but you do want to, most people want the truth, right? Uh, and like I said, they usually interrupt me uh, and they tell me, please, you know, tell them the truth. Uh, they want to know the, the real situation that, that they're in, right? So again, usually they want to know, but the last thing you want to do is we talk about their favorite uncle or a family member. Uh, it's really a no-win situation, right? So make sure you clarify with them who sold them the policy and make sure they want to hear the truth before you proceed any further. Now, this is the way the universal life policies really should work. And this is how you should explain it to your prospect, uh, family member or not, right? Uh, each year when they get a pay raise or their income goes up or they've had any kind of a, a good increase in income, you should put back a portion of your pay raise uh, back in this IUL to continue to build this savings bucket out to where you have a lot more money to draw on in your IUL savings bucket because it's going to, it's going to, re to return to you an increased amount of interest, right? That not only will keep this policy in force to age 100, but it'll also exponentially increase your savings account with compounded interest, right? So to make you understand how good a deal this is for the consumer by being able to basically overfund this policy and continue to put more money into the policy. So the target premium being $100 per month, let's, you, you go into, let's just say you go to 110, 115, 120, all the way up to maybe $150, which will not raise the ire of the, of the IRS, the ire of the IRS, right? So you can basically go from here to, to probably about $150 and be fine, right? Now, you just increased the size of your bucket by two times, right? Now you have this whole bucket here of in money earning interest to not only fund this policy as the premiums get, uh, well, I'm just gonna go in red. As, as your cost of insurance continues to increase, you've got that covered and you're building a, an ex an, a, a large savings account for the consumer. So that's the way it ought to be explained. As they're getting uh, pay raises, they add to the account. They don't underfund the account and have it blow up. That's the way it's really designed to work. So when you, if you've done this properly, when you get ready to retire, you can begin to take loans from your savings tax-free. And that's why the IRS caps it on the amount of money that you can put in, in, into this policy tax-free. And that's why you have the IRS concerns there, is you want to be careful how much overfunding you do here. Usually you can go up about 25%. So you've had insurance and you've added to your retirement with more tax-free savings. Now the question you should be asking yourself or asking me is, Steve, should everybody own a policy like this? Well, in theory, yes. In practicality, no. And let me tell you why that is. But just to be clear on the last example that I showed you, as they put money into this based on their pay raises every year, we're moving the line up as to when this policy could potentially lapse based on the amount of their savings. So we're going to take it all the way up to 150, right? So the point is, is that when you are overfunding like this and adding money into the IUL, look what it's done to their savings account. Now, rather than just have this amount right here, they now have this amount right here that they've invested throughout their, their, uh, the whole time they've had this policy, right? And like I said, they, when, when they retire, they can pull money out of this policy at 0% interest, tax-free. Now look at the size of the bucket. So I want to go back and cover that briefly with you so I make sure that's clear because I want you to really kind of grasp it. So getting back to the, uh, now that I messed up my diagram here, maybe I can do it over here. 
I'm just looking at my monitor here, see if I got room to type it over here. Maybe I'll do this. We'll do it in here. So we're talking about uh, should everybody, Steve, have a policy like that? And I said in uh, in yes, in theory, in practicality, no. And here's why. Okay, so let's discuss this for a second, right? Five percent of the population. are savers, right? So 5%, if you had five kids, one of them, I guarantee you, will be a saver. So 5% of the population are savers. Then you have the other 5%, this group of people here, they're not savers naturally. You can beat them into it and you know, and talk them into it and you know, give, apply some high pressure and you can get them to save, right? But they're not naturally savers like this bunch over here. They're, they're gonna save no matter what you do to them, right? Uh, then there's the 70% of the population that has to kind of be tricked into saving by setting up some sort of a payment plan uh, that's hidden maybe behind some insurance, which is what we do, right, uh, for benefits they, they need today. So they need life insurance today. The savings account is a component of the, uh, of the plan, not something they've totally bought into, but they'll make their $100 payments every month because they need the insurance, right? They're going to make their payments, but they will not save. Um, then you have 20% of the population that just will not save no matter what, right? Okay, so let's wrap this up. So now this 70% population here, these people here that uh, will raid any kind of account that has money in it, this is not the plan for them because as soon as they start building up some cash, some savings into this plan, they'll go and raid it, like I said, for the next vacation or the next shiny object. But they're a perfect plan to sell what we call return of premium, which is a policy that if you pay on it for 20 years, it doesn't build up cash value, but if you outlive the policy, in other words, you're, you're still living at the end of the policy, the end of the 20-year policy, uh, you're going to get majority, if not all, depending on the, on the policy and the carrier of your money back. So it's a money back plan, but there's no cash value they can go borrow. They're perfect for that type of a plan here, not a uh, universal life program, okay? And in this situation, they'd have a lot of money they would not otherwise have because you tricked them into uh, a savings plan they really weren't on board with in the first place. Now, this group, the five percenters, uh, they are perfect people to sell a universal life policy to because they're not going to raid the account. Remember, they can be tricked into it. Some of them are natural uh, savers to begin with, uh, depending on which group we're talking about. And again, these people here, the 70 percenters, um, are going to raid the, the, any kind of account like this. So you had to trick them into savings, uh, and that's why you want to use the money back plan. Now, in the 20 percenters over here, they won't even get started. Remember, they're not savers. No matter what you do, they're not going to save. So you kind of have to understand the people that you're dealing with, the people you're sitting in front of in the home. So hopefully this makes sense to you. Uh, the IUL or the Universal Life Savings Bucket Program, how these things work, how they're funded, how they're paid for, the cost of insurance uh, when you start out and it increases over time. And that's why these things blow up and leave the client without any coverage at all. If you understand how to explain these things, and you may have to watch this a couple times, give me a call, we'll talk through it. But very simply, they're not funded correctly, or an agent comes behind you and sells them on the minimum payment, not the target payment. They're underfunding the policy, and it's gonna blow up. And if you can explain that to them, have their policies out in front of you and show them the year this policy is gonna blow up, how much cash they have uh, built up, how much they should have, uh, it really does build a great trust relationship, and we believe people buy on a like-no-trust relationship. But listen, you have to understand the kind of people that you're sitting in front of um, and be able to tell whether or not you should even propose one of these type policies, right? So again, you kind of have to figure out, are there, and I would just ask them, are you, are you folks savers by nature? Um, and they'll tell you usually, right? So I hope this video has helped you. Um, uh, watch it a few times, save it. Uh, like it, make a comment on it. Um, if you want, ask questions. We can talk about this more. But it's something that I learned very early on, as I said, from my mentor. And I find this kind of a model really uh, helpful to understand because, like I said, it's not just universal life. Uh, all life insurance is built on this model, and it's important for you to understand 
how that model works so you can talk about it intelligently. Uh, now, you can make a lot of sales without knowing this, but this is a game changer when you do understand it and you can sit down and explain it to your prospects, right? When you need something like this, uh, you can access this video uh, and get a quick refresher before you're going into the home, right? So I appreciate it and uh, do me a favor and again, hit the bell below. You'll get instant notifications. We will be doing some live streaming throughout the course of the month and uh, uh, that you'll get instant notification. Do me a favor and like the video and also I'd love to hear your comments. Hit the subscribe button. It really helps get this video out to more people that need this kind of information and hope they get be successful in this great industry. As usual, my name is Steve Houston. I have Angela here as well and uh, give us a call if we can help you in any way, shape, or form. Uh, we are agency owners. We're looking to build our agency as well, but we want to help everybody to see it in this great industry. If I can help you, you can call me, text me, or you can email me. Bye-bye. Have a great day. Okay, well, that's a wrap. My name is Steve Houston. I have Angela Jar here as well. Here's my disclaimer that I've been sharing here recently, so there's no confusion. Uh, this channel is my desire to help all of you succeed in the business. Uh, I am an agency owner. We, uh, we own our own agency. We are expanding nationwide, and we are looking for people that are a fit for us to work together that kind of buy into our mission and what we're doing here. However, um, some of you out there may be brand new looking to join the industry. Fantastic. Uh, let's talk and uh, see if we're a fit to work together. Some of you may also be out there looking to join uh, or, or change to a different IMO that maybe provide some training and support. Uh, an IMO that uh, will take your calls and the agency that there that's there for you hands-on each and every day. Uh, we are not recruiters. Uh, we are hiring agents. What I mean by that is is that Andrew and I, we believe this is not a do-as-I-say business. It's a do-as-I-do business. And I believe you're going to lead people, build an agency, and help people succeed in this industry. You have to know what you're talking about. You have to be able to dress up every day and go out there, put the uniform on, and go sit kneecap to kneecap with people in their kitchen. Uh, just like what you're telling your agents or asking your agents to do as well. That's who we are. If that resonates with you, uh, and we can, again, like I said, have a conversation, see if it's a fit for us to work together, and partner up. I don't believe it's a sign-up thing. Go watch my video. It's not a sign-up thing. It's a partnership. It's two people locking arms together, giving it 100%, and if we can do that, you can change your life in this business financially and having a tremendous work-life balance. To find out more, let's get on the phone. Let's have a discussion to find out if it's a fit for us to partner up. Either way, I want you on this channel. I appreciate you being on this channel, and I am grateful that you're finding value uh, in our videos. Our contact information is listed below in the description, and we hope we've helped you uh, today with this video. Bye-bye now. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. <laughs> Bye now.